Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll, and today we're going to talk about reality. We like to think that almost all episodes of Mindscape talk about reality in one way or another, but today we're going to dig a little bit more deeply into what it means for something to be real. You know what that means. We're going to be talking philosophy as well as science. Some things you just know are real, tables and chairs being classic examples of things you know are real, but we could even question them. But there's other categories where the issue is less clear. Are morals real? Is the ability to make free choices and to have free will real in the world? What about numbers? What about a perfect sphere and other mathematical structures? Are they real in the same way? So today's guest is James Ladyman, who is a philosopher whose work is distinguished by insisting that philosophy, metaphysics, ontology, and so forth, had better be informed by our best current scientific knowledge. Everyone agrees with this as a sort of cliche, but James really tries to make it real in his philosophy. And one of the issues that comes up when you try to do that as a metaphysicist, metaphysician they say, sorry about that, is one of the things about science is that it keeps changing our idea of what is really real, right? Aristotle had some idea of what reality is. Newton had a different idea. Einstein had a different idea. Schrodinger had yet a different idea. How can you hope to have any purchase on the idea of what is real if the scientific stuff of which the world is made keeps changing as our understanding improves? So James is championing an idea called structural realism, that it's the patterns, the structures that relate different things in the world that really matter, that are real, not the actual stuff out of which it's made. Maybe someday we'll understand what that stuff is perfectly, but the patterns between different objects remain in good shape even as you make a transition from Newtonian physics to relativity and so forth. There are very plausibly down-to-earth consequences of a view like this. One of the other things that James has been working on is the idea of complexity and complex structures, and whether there is something truly new that comes into being when simple pieces come together to form something complex. This is an issue of obvious philosophical relevance, but it's also very important for computer science, for biology, for physics, and so forth. Now, I'll I'll be honest, this is a mind-bending episode, no doubt about it, so put your thinking caps on and let's go. James Ladyman, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you, Sean. So just in case we don't get through all of our many topics to discuss, I want to start with some of the big picture questions. So you're an expert on metaphysics and philosophy. So tell me what is real? Well, I want to know whether you mean what is meant by real or do you want examples of what's real or what things that I think are real? that are controversial or what? So yeah, unless you have some wacky ideas about examples, why don't we give a definition of what it means for something to be real? In a book I wrote with Don Ross called Everything Must Go, we used this idea of Dan Dennett that to be is to be a real pattern. Okay. So that is a putative definition of what's real. And the story there is something like, What's real is what it's necessary to talk about if you want to uh, capture information about the world and in particular uh, capture, uh, want to make predictions and explanations. So, So on that kind of view, it doesn't make any sense to say something's real, but by the way, you can't predict or explain anything with it. Okay, very good. Um, so... If you take that kind of view, um, you're tying reality to kind of indispensability in a predictive explanatory scheme. The, 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 the good thing about that way of thinking about things is it, it's, it gives a unified account of, of reality between common sense, everyday life, and science. So, for example, I would say the table's real because yep. I need to talk about it to get by in the world. Um, but I can also say, you know, the Andromeda galaxy is real because I need to talk about it to, to systematize the observations I have of, of the universe. Um, now, part of the, the criterion is 
non-redundancy and uh, information efficiency. So I'll give you an example. Um, the reason why it's good to talk about the table rather than just the parts of the table is because if I talked about all the parts of the table separately, it would take me much longer to say things and make predictions than if I just talk about the table as a whole. But the reason for that is because the table hangs together as a whole. And talking about it as an object serves a purpose. Talking about it as an object serves a purpose. Whereas, let's Don Ross's favorite example is, um, or used to be, um, the, the compound object of my left earlobe, Miles Davis's last solo, and the largest elephant in Namibia. You, you combine those things and you get no extra purchase on the world that right. you have, than you have by talking about them, each of them separately. And so for that reason, that that's, wouldn't count as a bona fide object. Yeah, so there's, there's, there, those are separately real things. They're separately real things, but the, but the compound of them is not right. a real thing. Okay. Whereas um, the compound of the parts of the table is a real thing because they hang together, but roughly speaking. I mean, but, but we could put it, you know, slightly artificially. We could say something like, well, um, you know, in order to tr track the, the, the behavior of the parts of the, of the, the behavior of the world, you know, I talk about the table because I can move the table from here to there and all the parts stay together. Um, I can do a kind of dynamics of the table if I was interested in rolling the table across the room or something. Do we worry that this puts too much emphasis on usefulness to us human beings? Right. So that's, that's an objection to this. So some people will say, look, that's just epistemological. You're just talking about what you need to talk about to keep track of things. And that's not the same thing as, as what's, what's real. Uh, it, my view would be, yes, it is. Uh, th I mean, the whole point of this is to say, no, but what we mean by real, what, what counts as real is what, what we need to talk about to to track the track the phenomena in the sense that r the notion of reality is a word that we invented and we're going to assign to it meanings that are useful to us yeah or you could say or you could say well let's just look at uncontentious examples um, of what's real and try to generalize and abstract away a, a, a criterion for you know abstract away what well, well, in virtue of what are we calling those things real and the thought is, well, all the uncontentious examples satisfy um, this criterion. And uh, examples that we don't want to count as real, like the one I just mentioned of the, the compound of the earlobe and the solo and the elephant, violate the criterion. Right. So it's doing a reasonable job with paradigmatic examples. And therefore is useful for contested examples. Right. And aren't there people who are a little bit more extremist about this and say that even things like tables and chairs aren't real, only right. the sort of fundamental layer of reality is real? Right. So th th there are lots of people who say, I mean, you, you probably know the quote that's attributed to Rutherford, I think. Um, in, in science, there's, there's physics and there's stamp collecting. Yes, I know it well. A colleague of mine has it on a poster on their door. <laughs> right. So the thought there is something like, okay, we want to distinguish between the stuff which pragmatically we talk about and the really real. Right. I could talk for a while about why I don't think that's the right way to go. Um, but for the moment, I'll just say... I understand that view, but I disagree with it. Well, certainly by the standards you just said, things like tables and chairs do serve this function. We should definitely call them real. Yeah, and I mean, I sometimes find that philosophers will say, I mean, a lot of philosophers will say this, right, that, that all that's real is the fundamental level yeah. or the, the ultimate building blocks or something. And what I'll say to that is something like this. Look, I'm interested in the distinction which we make between unicorns and horses, right? If you tell me all that's really real, uh, the fundamental building blocks, then I'll just say, okay, real schmeal, right? <laughs> uh, what I'm interested in is the distinction that we make in everyday life and in science between things that we hypothesize but then decide don't exist and, or that people claim exist but we, we think there's no evidence for and the things that we do think exist like horses 
And that's the distinction I'm interested in. And that's the distinction which I think I've got a good grip on. Um, if you talk to me about some putative fundamental level, which nobody has ever found and we don't have, then I'm going to say, but that's not the distinction that we're marking with our ordinary talk of what's of reality. Right. According to which horses are part of reality and unicorns aren't. But there are, let's move on to the more contentious example, more contentious examples. Um, uh, numbers are numbers real? Good. I mean, they're not gonna, they're not gonna fit the real patterns account. So we then have to say, okay, the real patterns account is an account of concrete empirical reality or something. You, as well as numbers, you could talk about, I don't know, uh, courage or, uh, mm. you know, abstract. Love. Uh, yeah. Um, You're not gonna tell me love is not real, James. Come on. Um, you know the three illusions that human life is based on, Sean? I don't know those. Um, the self, free will, and love. I'm a big fan of all of those illusions. <laughs> we all are. No, love is real. But um, it's not real in the same way that, that horses are, I guess. And, and what we're interested in the book is, is giving an account of real that's... Um, going to be applicable to the kind of questions that people discuss in philosophy of science when they ask are atoms real uh how can you know are tables real as well as atoms um so so good so so the real patterns account is a is a partial account and um if you want to allow the reality of abstract objects then the criterion is going to have to be modified um so I, 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 I'll, I'll say something disjunctive, right? You, you can either say the real patterns account just is what's real full stop and all this other stuff is, is not, or you can say the real patterns account is a good account of empirical reality and we have to say something different about abstractor. Now, my own view is about numbers is that there's something misleading about saying that the number two is real. Uh, and there's also something about misleading about saying the number two is not real. I completely agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. So you mentioned, by the way, the book. You mean the book Everything Must Go with you and Don Ross? Yeah. Right. And so I can, I can imagine in the real patterns account, I mean, in some sense, the number five or the concept of love do denote real patterns. They certainly cert they do explanatory work, right? If I say I have five apples, people know what that means. It's a meaningful statement, right? But it's uh, I I think I agree with what you're saying is that the number five doesn't exist in the same sense that a table exists. It doesn't have this physical reality, right? I mean, it's is not, that a meaningful distinction? Yeah, uh, um, definitely. Um, but the, the the status of mathematical objects is something that I've thought about for a very long time. It's very close to my heart and I I don't know what the right view is. Okay. Um, one thing I do think is there's so, it, it's less misleading to say something like there is reality to mathematics. Now, uh, why is that less misleading? I would say because what that conveys is something like the thought that rea that mathematics is objective and mind independent or something right that we don't right. just get we don't just make it up right um, and that that's that is my view about mathematics um, but you know th there are lots of people who know a lot about mathematics who disagree with that yeah um, I mean, I was just talking about this with someone the other evening and I was saying, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I sometimes think, oh, well, my kind of belief that mathematics is an objective in reality that we discover rather than invent is to do with the fact that, you know, I went to university to do pure maths and maths was my kind of first intellectual love. But then there are people who are much more math mathematicians than I am who would say, no, it's just a formal system. I make up some <laughs> rules and yeah. then I see what follows. So, I mean, that's one of the very interesting things about mathematics is that within the mathematical community, 
the Platonism is not Platonism by which I mean the view that, that maths is a, has an independent reality or something um, is not not the dominant view among mathematicians um, and that's quite interesting I mean there are these people who devote their lives to studying this subject matter and, and are quite happy with the idea that, that, that it's all in, invented or that, 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 that there isn't a, a reality to it as opposed to just the playing out of inferences based on it rules. I mean, what 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 people sometimes call if thenism is a kind of crude version of this view, right? Yeah. You just you just say, well, what follows if? I think so, that makes sense to me. Like, it might it might be a crude version, but I think yeah, it's a set of conditional statements, right? Right, but then you know the thing that people always say in reply to that is isn't doesn't there seem to be this sense in which mathematics is is built into the world because there's this close connection between this the the the, the discourse and uh, the, of abstractions and uh, application uh, and reality. Um, this is a, this is a very difficult yeah. <laughs> issue. <laughs> but wait, I think I didn't quite get your where you were coming down. So I get that in for mathematical objects. Um, you're a little bit open. You, the, you can see the force of arguments on either side. And where, where did you come down about love and courage being real? A- accepting that this is us deciding how to design, decide, define in terms rather than us learning new things about the universe. I'll come down on love and courage being real. Um, I mean, when people ask what's real, they often mean, you know, what are the objects? Um, and philosophers would say something like, you know, first order quantification. You know? <laughs> um, well, you know, love isn't an object, um, but properties can be real too. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think talk, talking ab- about characteristics like that seems to be indispensable in understanding human beings so so then where does that bring you down on free will being real or not free will now that's just a difficult one because i never really know what's meant by that i always say to my students free will is always supposed to be problematized by determinism right and then people say and you get all these people saying stuff like, oh, yeah, so because we have quantum mechanics, we can have free will or something, right? And then I think, we oh, right. Agree that's nonsense. Right, because because then I think, oh, right, that's okay then, yeah, because it's a, my actions are the result of some stochastic event, right? That doesn't make me free. I want my actions to be caused. Yeah. I just want them to be caused by my deliberations, right? Um, so I suppose my view on free will is... And it's, this is something I'm no way an expert and haven't thought nearly enough about. And, you know, this is really impressionistic. But but I think probably my view is might be quite close to Humean kind of compatibilism. That I think, I think the right thing to say is something like, I'm free when I can tell a plausible story about why I did what I did in terms of my deliberations. Um, I'm, I don't need that to be something that's outside the causal structure of reality i mean if you want to tell me some facts about how my deliberations are the result of in the end the physical goings on in my brain i don't mind i mean as long as the right thing to say is that i did it because i decided to rather than someone held a gun to my head then it would seem like i was free but I mean, here that you know it's really difficult because I think there are so many levels of freedom. So, um, you know, I freely choose, but I have a habit. Is that free? I, I, I freely choose, but I decide very quickly, and I'm um, I'm clicking on something on a web page that's outrageous. Um, you know, that that isn't full blown freedom. I think. Um, so. Maybe the right thing to say about free will is it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, that there are there are degrees. Um. So in this book with Don Ross, everything must go. You defend a view called structural realism. Mm-hmm. So this is a particular point of view on what counts as real, right? How well, would you tell us what structural realism is? Well, structural realism started out as a view about about scientific theories that 
and and the reality of the posits of scientific theories in the light of the fact that that theories change and that um, we've had very good theories which we now think are, are not 100% true and um, we if we're wise we will think that not everything in our current theories is 100% true. And so what we want to do is have a sensible form of, of realism about science um, by sensible meaning a view that's compatible with, with the fact of theory change and the fact that sometimes theory change can be quite radical in respect of the, the fundamental claims that are made. So, um, for example, uh, Newtonian... Um, physics says there's absolute time we don't think there's absolute time it says that that mass is an intrinsic property of objects we don't think it is it says that there's uh, instantaneous action at a distance due to gravity we don't think there is Um, and yet uh, I would say there's a kind of reality to Newtonian forces Um, and you know of course the great thing about Newtonian gravitation was it made novel predictions so if we think that novel prediction is the reason why we commit ourselves to what scientific theories say exist we have to realize that that's that they can make those predictions whilst not being 100 percent correct now the point of structural realism is not to say there's a distinction between structure and nature and we should believe the structure not the nature it's just to say when you look at those cases where we've abandoned theories what you find is that you it's much easier to see the continuity with our current theories at the mathematical or structural level than it is at the level of the fundamental claims those theories make about right. about reality and so there's this so what reality is might differ from theory to theory but there's something that is maintained and I would say something like, you know, yeah, what's maintained are the real patterns at some level of approximation. Right. So, uh, uh, I mean, we were hearing all about um, dark matter and um, the thing that dark matter is needed for is is for compatibility with the emergent correctness of Newton's law of gravitation, right? Um, so even in the light of general relativity, we still think that Newton's law is a low energy limit that's a real pattern for many practical purposes um, within a domain up to some degree of accuracy. So I guess the idea of structural realism in the most basic level is is to say, well, look, if you loosen up a bit about, about reality, you can understand how our theories can be getting things right without getting everything 100% right and the way I put it is in terms of the theories capturing the kind of causal structure of the world the the law like structure of the world I mean philosophers would I would say the modal structure of the world but that's not a word that many people use um, what how would you define it relations of necessity and possibility between okay. events um, so what is necessary what is possible what is not necessary possible. what possible and 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 what what follows given you know so um and and you newtonian mechanics is going to be just as good at predicting the return of comets as it was in the 17th 18th centuries yeah. um yeah so does that help yeah, no, well, it helps, but it leaves me with this with this question because I get the usefulness or the attractiveness of structural realism to help us maintain belief that older theories that have since been superseded nevertheless captured some aspect of reality. Right. And it's the structures that it were being captured. But is it just the structures? Is that really all there is to reality, the relations between different things, or is there some... St- Thing or set of things, even if we don't know what that set is, that we would label as real things. Right. You see, if you take the real patterns view, then things are kind of ways of of describing the structure. And and if there you know if there are no if there are no patterns, there's no point talking about the thing. So it it's kind of like the 
the pattern is primary the, the thing is is the way of identifying the pattern the way of just talking about it one of the thoughts of structural realism is that we have this object property way of thinking um, but our, our physical theories are not just our physical theories now I mean many theories theories in economics theories in mathematical biology aren't really easily translatable into object property talk right and and one of the thoughts behind structural realism is or at least the way I think about structural realism and, and I think Don does um, and I think David Wallace thinks this way is a kind of mathematical representation is primary and we shouldn't expect that we can translate our best theories without residue out of that mathematical representation would we go so far? I mean, it seems like we're talking about relations, but are reluctant to say that there exist the things that are being related <laughs> by these relations. I mean, you see what, where my yeah. issue comes in. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I think of... I mean, you can't talk about relations without talking about things that are related. Um, that's a kind of logical Good. point. <laughs> but whenever you talk about any actual cases we have of things we find that when you investigate them a bit further um, they are collections of relations among other things right okay. so you know relations all the way down well at least maybe maybe um, and if maybe then don't assume not yeah okay it's modally possible <laughs> <laughs> epistemically possible yeah okay. for all we yeah. know um i mean i guess what we come up against a lot in science and philosophy uh is the, the the sort of unknown limits of of our cognition and the way we conceptualize the world you know to what extent are our theories based on how the world is and to what extent are they based on how we have to think about things right that probably like the kind of i don't know if i'm right to say this but i would say <laughs> stick my neck out and say that maybe the basic insight we get from kant is that there's a the, the, the possibility that the way that we conceptualize things conditions our representations uh, and that plays a role to some extent as well as how things are how the world is um, so you know we can't escape our own cognition and say well you know suppose I wasn't this contingent being with, that, that has evolved this limited way of thinking about things What, how would I think then well I just can't right I am this contingent being who yeah. has these ways of thinking it's not a meaningful counterfactual no so but but it is worth worth recognizing like what given that we've reached the level of sophistication we have we can now see that maybe we are in that situation maybe our cognition isn't apt to describe the fundamental nature of reality as it is in itself or something um and therefore i think a degree of kind of hedging and um, kind of agnosticism is uh, is appropriate here yeah you know? okay and this whole field this area in which these conversations take place is metaphysics right yeah that's how we Philosoph label it I mean, philosophy of science um, but I think the conversations take place within science itself okay well in fact that's what I was going to lean in toward because in your book you sort of talk about scientific metaphysics yeah well our and, book's called the subtitle of our book is metaphysics naturalized right and you get and, a hard time to conventional what we call analytic metaphysics yeah which is not which is a fairly recent i mean the phenomenon in the way that it's currently done i guess um so can you, can you just you know for background purposes explain a little bit the way it's currently done and what you're reacting against yeah so what we react against is is two things um, at least one is um, a priori kind of first philosophy approaches that say I don't 
need to know about science. I'll just think about um, the fundamental nature of reality using from the armchair without scientific knowledge. Right. Um, so, for example, you get debates in metaphysics about, you know, what would it, what, what, in virtue of what do some parts form a whole? Uh, now, I would say, well, depends what you're talking about. In virtue of what do cells form an organism? Right. Well, the, the specific nature of the interactions and relationships between them that, that aren't generic, aren't knowable a priori, right? right? In virtue of what do if you had Atom. never met an organism or a cell, you would not be able to say why cells formed an organism. Right, and if you if you don't know physics, you can't say in virtue of what the atoms form the table, right? Right. Um, th there are spe th it's specific to those things, how they interact. Um, one of the themes there is that we point out that in science, composition is dynamical it's not um kind of a static thing right so there's a kind of image i'd have all these parts and then they are a whole for some reason or other whereas in science like no these parts are a whole because of how they're interacting and often what we talk about is interactions that are taking place on a very short time and length scales relative to the scale we're interested in right and so it can seem like there are just these parts but they're actually you know the table is a dynamical entity right um yeah so that's 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 an example of the kind of way you can get into thinking about reality if you don't pay attention to science you just think a priori another thing that we object to is the imposing of the manifest image on the scientific image um, so, for example, a kind of view of building blocks or little little particles bumping into each other, which we would regard as completely outdated in the light of physics. Uh, another thing and we call because that quantum mechanics and because quantum of quantum mechanics theory. and and but, you know even before that with field theory or whatever. But but um, we call that the domestication of science, right? Mm. So we say that that you know, it's, one thing is ignore science completely, another thing is take science. And then distort it so it fits your common sense way of thinking about things, and then kind of pretend that you're talking about the scientific objects, but you're not really because you're you're not talking about them as they are. Right. Um, and I guess you know our, we have a positive conception of metaphysics, which is one that I think scientists engage in, whether or not they would call it metaphysics. Um, so this is why I don't think this is just a, a, a philosophical game or, or activity that, you know, I think people do it all the time. So for example, you wrote a book about it, right? Um, what, what can we say about the whole of reality right. in the light of our knowledge of physics? How does reality, how does reality at the macroscopic level re relate to the microscopic level? How does biology relate to chemistry, relate to physics? Um, so what we say is naturalized metaphysics is the attempt to say something about the world as a whole in the light of all the science that we have. It's some, and another way of putting that is to say something like naturalized metaphysics is about saying how science as a whole hangs together. Um, it's about the unification of science, I guess. Um, so it can't be, see, it sounds like you're arguing that metaphysics can't really be prior to science because until we've learned things about how the world works, we have no hope of just a priori coming up with these relations, but it still adds something to science because it talks about things that cross scientific disciplines or transcend them. Right, and I, I'm, I think the ultimate test is it needs to contribute, actually, and you know, this may be unrealistic and ridiculously ambitious, but I think when we wrote our book, we were we were saying, look, this should actually help scientists who are interested in um, in how the world is, and it should play some kind of role. And if it doesn't, we should stop talking about it. Um, <laughs> but we didn't set a time limit on that. Okay, that's very clever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, you often get scientists actually making metaphysical claims. So I, I, I give an example. Um, Sir Paul Nurse, who was a president of the Royal Society, came and gave a talk in Bristol. He talked about the five most important ideas in biology. 
And one of them, he said, was biological processes are physical slash chemical processes. Um, his example was um, the discovery that the fermentation of yeast is oxidation, right? That this is, is a way of unifying biology with chemistry. It's a way of understanding biological processes as nothing, no special added ingredient, no extra mystery, just a very complicated emergent phenomenon that that is ultimately resulting from chemical and physical processes now that's a metaphysical claim yep and his he but he didn't come to give a metaphysics talk he came to tell everyone about biology and he would regard that as a biological discovery i i would say and this is not really i mean, definitely not at all but my idea uh david papineau I guess was a person who I, I learned this from, um, chronicled how physicalism as a view about the mind um, and more generally um, was a contingent empirical discovery. There was no reason to think it had to be true a priori. So in the 19th century, people wondered, are there special physiological forces? Uh, are there special chemical forces? Right. right now, there's nothing crazy about that. I mean, a priori, maybe, you know, um, it just turned out that there was no need to posit such things. Uh, we now understand chemistry in terms of predominantly electromagnetism. So if you're wanting to do justice to what's been learned in the history of science, then you need to say, well, we've learned this metaphysical thing, right? Which is about the relationship between chemistry and physics. And, um, that is all by way of exemplifying why it's not true that metaphysics is this other thing compared to science. Um, it, it, it is sort of connect, you know, it's connected to first order scientific practice, not everybody's scientific practice. Lots of scientists don't have to care about these issues at all, but every now and again, they're really crucial and some scientists think about them a lot and don't separate thinking about them from being scientists. So I was very interested at a poster session uh, last night. We're here, for those of you uh, in podcast land, at a meeting of the Philosophy of Science Association. And there was a poster by a guy who had surveyed philosophers of science, among other things, on the question of you know what was the biggest challenge or what was the biggest uh, flaw in their field right now and uh there were two big things that people held out as big flaws one was not enough engagement with science and one was not enough engagement with philosophy <laughs> apparently because they thought that as philosophers of science they were you know isolated within their philosophy departments so how do you think i mean i think you just said a little bit about how you think the relationship should go how do you think the relationship between philosophy and science and philosophy of science does go right now in practice and, and do you see it changing very good question how it is for me um is that I spend more time engaging with scientists, I think, than I do philosophers. And I, uh, well, well, the philosophers who aren't philosophers of science. Um, and so I would say in my field as well, I mean, I think in philosophy of physics, which is the, the main area that I work on, as well as kind of general philosophy of science, um, the engagement is very close. And I think it's very healthy. Um, I see it is probably a, you know going in the right direction as well i think that more and more physicists are realizing that that philosophers of physics know what they're talking about and they're not doing kind of philosophy not, not thinking about physics from a distance um a lot of the young people are exceptionally good and really knowledgeable about the physics i mean some of them have got two phds it's not that unusual that they have a phd in physics right. and a phd in philosophy um I think the intellectual standards and the level of engagement is very high. Now, of course, one still finds you know, the odd physicist who thinks that philosophers are idiots who don't know anything about physics. But you, in my own institution, I've written papers with physicists. I teach in the physics department as well as in the, as well as in the philosophy department. 
uh, have very good relations. Uh, we have lots of joint honours students. So really the interaction is, is strong and I don't think I'm that unusual in that respect. Do you think that's a, a change over recent years? Are the barriers coming down or were they just less high than I thought? I think the barriers come down a bit. I mean, I think w when I was learning my subject, it was true then that the philosophers of physics, people like Michael Redhead and Jeremy Butterfield and Nancy Cartwright, were very knowledgeable about physics. Right. Um, and I think you can look back now on some of their work in the foundations of quantum mechanics and say this was absolutely top notch by anyone's standards. Um, so I guess I'm lucky that I absorbed that culture early on. Um, I mean, the point about how philosophy of science relates to the rest of philosophy, it depends what part of philosophy you're talking about. I mean, I go to seminars in my department on ethics and aesthetics, and I'm interested in, in general philosophy. Uh, but where I'm less keen on the pure philosophy is where I think science bears on it, but people are doing it in ignorance of science. And I, in those kinds of areas, I'm sympathetic to this quote that we have in our book from the philosopher Quine, who said, philosophy of science is, is philosophy enough. Oh, I had not heard that quote. <laughs> um, I think what he <laughs> would say, I mean, I think, so for example, you take epistemology. Um, epistemology is about knowledge, about justification. Well, in philosophy of science, we have people who study Bayesianism and uh, confirmation theory and, and um, statistical methods of inference and so on. You know, I think really the idea of doing epistemology and not engaging with that kind of work is um, a bit odd. Um, and likewise with with philosophy of mind, I think, come on, you know, you've got to you've got to look at cognitive science. Why why would you sure. why would you want to do philosophy of mind without knowing about the science of the mind? How the mind works, yeah. And if you think about the history of philosophy, I don't think you know, many of the great philosophers were also great scientists. Some of them spent more time doing science than they did philosophy. I mean Aristotle would be an example. Um so I think, you know, if you if you reincarnated Aristotle or Kant or Descartes or Leibniz, um, they would be they would you know the, the last things on their reading list would be pure philosophy, right? Or they would be wanting to catch up with the scientific knowledge which has developed in the last hundreds of years since they were alive. That 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 would they would be super excited. Right. Um I mean, I thought that philosophy of science, maybe this is not quite what Quine said, but related, that philosophy of science should be or could be a paradigm for the rest of the philosophy in the sense that if there's any one thing that we should be able to understand at this fundamental level, it's science. Like right. science is in some sense so much easier than aesthetics or ethics, right? If well, we that's what I often say. I mean, I, out. ethics is pol or political philosophy much too hard for me. I'd much yeah. rather do try and learn quantum field theory than that. Um, but, you know, it's funny when people talk about science as if there was, it was this thing, right? Whereas it's kind of everything, right? I mean, what is science? <laughs> well, that includes anthropology and it includes economics and it includes biology and it includes cosmology. Uh, you know, it, it's the study of the world, right? right? Now, what's philosophy? Well, it's the attempt to understand the world, isn't it? So how could you really not do <laughs> philosophy of science? I mean, what, what, it doesn't really make much sense to me. Well, good. We're on the same side. There. <laughs> Speaking of which, though, um, to shift topics a little bit, but I think there is continuity here. Uh, you have a book um, in preparation on complex systems, which might be uh, an area of science and physics, uh, but also many other sciences are related to it, which is growing in popularity, but perhaps under philosophized. Is that fair to say? Yeah, lucky for me, it's under philosophized because um, Carolina Weisner with whom I've written this book, and I wrote a paper a few years ago called What is a Complex System? And you know, it came out in 2013, and it's got a lot of citations. Nah. <laughs> um, and I think part of the reason is because there just aren't that many papers, you know, on that topic. Um, and I'd Being like to think it's because I'd like to think it's because it's such a brilliant paper. But 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 I think at least part of the explanation is that there's a people are crying out for 
papers like that because they right. they want to think about complexity and complex systems and understand it. Um, yeah, that's that is an area that has been looked at by plenty of other philosophers of science other than myself, though. And, um, so you know, there, there, there's lots of other work out there. Um, you know, what one can think of. Um, you know, People, I mean, early early papers in philosophy of science by Herbert Simon, um, you know, way back um, on complex systems. More recent work um, by people like Bill Bechtel and um, Michael Strevens. Um, you know, other other people have worked on it, um, but it's a great area because um, it's it's the area of science that's, I guess giving us most understanding of, of emergence and emergence is precisely the name for whatever goes on when we have biology as well as chemistry as well as <laughs> physics um, so that's exactly what the, 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 the topic we were talking about how does science as a whole relate um, how do we get um, higher level structure out of out of the basics you know i like that, that definition of emergence i never heard that one before you know the, the thing that you need to explain a world where you get biology and chemistry as well as physics yeah um it's a contentious word right there's weak emergence and strong emergence I don't, and you people... know, i mean and i mean the problem with the philosophical literature on the topic is that uh, they're probably not a month goes by without somebody doesn't come up with a new taxonomy of different kinds of emergence right. and um when I wrote the big picture, I was I was warned by some philosophers, but even more sociologists, don't call it emergence because it means in some subfield exactly the opposite of what you want it to mean, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, a form of emergence that I like and, and try to promulgate where you have some microscopic understanding, but then there are ways of looking at the system from afar where you see a different kind of behavior that you might not have noticed but it's still impaled by the microscopic behavior and then there's this entirely different notion of emergence where the microscopic behavior just doesn't entail the macroscopic behavior and it's yeah that's right so, stronger so, than that. so some conceptions of emergence there's some extra magic ingredient that appears yeah or something i i don't know i don't know how to make sense of that the way that I've thought about emergence since working on complex systems is um, is is exemplified, I guess, by you know how ant colonies work, right? Um, no overall controller, but um, incredible emergence in the sense that you know the ants can build bridges, and not only that, I mean they can they can decide whether it's more efficient to build a bridge or go the long way around, right? Right. Um, they, they, they consider, you know, well, if we go the long way around, that's going to tie up the ants um, who are traveling. But if we build a bridge, it's going to tie up ants in being part of the bridge. Um, there's going to be a trade-off there, and they optimize pretty well. And yet no single ant is asking itself these and questions. No single ant. No, of course, when I say the ants, I mean, no ant is asking itself that question. So, so the interesting thing is, how does this arise then? And the answer is, it arises through interaction and feedback between individual ants. And that's the thing you've got to understand if you want to understand emergence. And this, of course, goes back to Anderson and more is different. Um, the, the importance of interactions among the parts of a system in giving rise to the behavior of a whole and, and feedback i think more and more i think now feedback is the key is is key um and in the case of human beings i think we really want to think hard about the feedback between ourselves and the technology that we've made in the form of um of smartphones say right where you know, you, you look and you think, well, 10 years ago, people didn't do everything on smartphones, right? Now they kind of do. Why is that feedback, basically? And so potentially new kinds of emergent behavior might be emerging. Right, which which we're seeing. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, feedback is the basis of our cognition anyway, right? Because uh, the way that we become conscious 
self-conscious, normal, let's say, uh, minds is by interacting with each other. I mean, if, if, if you have a human being doesn't interact with any other human beings, then, then they will not be able to learn language. They are, yeah. you know, they won't, they won't have many of the aspects which we say we're essential to human beings. So what that means is that it's essential to our natures that we develop in interaction. And what worries me quite a lot is, okay, so what's going to happen if that interaction is with technology? What's going to happen if that interaction is with an uh, AI system or a robot? We, then we become something different, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so is this providing a partial or complete answer to the question raised by the title of your new book? What is a complex system? Is it all about feedback and emergence from uh, constituent parts? Yeah. So what we say, I mean, what we say really is, you know, sometimes the right answer isn't terribly exciting and it's, it's the kind <laughs> of boring answer, right? And, and, and I think that's actually often true, you know. The right answer is, well, there are different kinds of complex system. They have different features. Not all of them have all the features. Um, what are your favorite features that make up a complex system? Um, nested structure, robustness um, of behavior or structure, um, modularity. So that means um, something like the division of labor, Division okay. of function, um, and also you know new kinds of um, invariance and universality that come about when you model systems as networks or you model them as information processing systems. So, is this? Those are some of the examples. Is this? I mean, is the aspiration that this would be a useful contribution of scientific metaphysics because we're noticing uh, regularities or universalities between very different kinds of systems? Yeah. and and the book is not a but primarily for philosophers. I wrote it with Carolina Weisner, as I said, she's a mathematician. Um, we started working together when Bristol opened a center for complexity sciences, it had a graduate program, and they wanted to have a component in that program that just asked the question, what is complexity? Um, the graduates were a heterogeneous bunch, you know, mm -hmm. some of them are working on um, the cells, some of them are working on um, the economy, some of them are working right. on you know, social structures of one kind or another, ants, you know, all sorts of things. Um, and right from the beginning, we were asking the question, is there, what is complexity? Is there a single thing? Is this, you know, one kind of cynical view uh, is, is something like, there's no such thing as complexity, it's just a buzzword that people use to get grants. Um, because for a period, it really was a very big buzzword, <laughs> as I'm sure yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and the view that we've ended up taking is uh, a kind of middle view. Yeah, there is there is a kind of distinctive phenomena here, but there isn't a single thing called complexity. And one of the things we do in the book is we discuss the different measures of complexity that have been proposed in the literature, of which there are many. Um, I proposed one. Okay. <laughs> it's not in your book, I'm sure, but... It might be. Uh... Um, maybe it's not, no. But what we say basically is that each of these measures is measuring a feature of a complex system and it's not measuring complexities per se but let me give you an example i mean some of the measures clearly what they really measure is order mm -hmm. of one kind or right. another right exactly uh, now order could have been produced by a central controller and that's not what we associate with complex systems the measure itself can't tell you whether the order that you've got, where it came from, it just tells you how much order there is. So, for example, if you imagine a string of digits, yeah. you can calculate right, well what's the order, um, how you know what kind of correlations are there at what length scales in that string, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't tell you where that string came from. But if you know that that came from a complex system, then it's a kind of proxy measure for the complexity of that system. But it's not measuring complexity as such; it's measuring order produced by a complex system. And is this, so what definition of complexity is this? Does this have a name? I know that Jim Crutchfield, for example, likes to always stop people when he, they measure complexity and says, like, which measure of complexity are you using? Right. So what we're saying is each of the measures of complexity is measuring a feature of complex systems. And that's why there are lots of different measures. So you don't have to choose because if what you're measuring is something like the, um, you know, how cliquey is the network? 
for example, yeah. um, you may want to measure that in terms of the kind of average connectivity of nodes or something, right? Um, or the degree of clustering of nodes or, or whatever. Um, there are perfect, you know, there are good, useful measures of such things. But if you were studying a different aspect of a complex system, you'd be do using a different measure. So you might, for example, have a measure of the robustness of the system. Uh, so what we're saying is there are different features that complex systems have, and there are measures of those features. Um, there's no one true measure of complexity. And are there, or should we hope to find laws of complex systems, like we find laws of thermodynamics, or arguably even in biology? I think you get you get things like power laws that that turn up in different places, and you can associate those with complexity. Um, but I, I don't think we're going to have something like you know a law of all complex systems. No, I don't think that that doesn't make a lot of sense. I think. Well, we had um, uh, our symposium that brought us here. Uh, we talked about the notion of fundamentality, which is mm -hmm. sort of on the opposite side of complexity in some sense, maybe. And uh, you brought up an interesting issue that in some sense we talk about the standard model of particle physics as being very fundamental, right? It talks about elementary particles and so forth. But in a very different sense, we talk about uh, Darwinian evolution, natural selection as also fundamental. But the words fundamental clearly mean something very, very different in those two cases. One means that it, you know, microscopically describes everything around us. The other is it would still hold true if the microscopic description of everything around us was utterly different. So there's some robustness uh, that extends across possible worlds we could live in. So well, I guess what I'm getting at for the complex systems could there be Darwin-like behavior that you say, once you have a system satisfying these criteria, we can have certain expectations about how it might behave? Good. Um, in, in answer to that, I would say, yes, there could be. So, for example, there might be... Um, I guess you could say, well, look, some of the laws in, in biology, like the price equation or something, you know, um, are, are just that, right? They're, they're emergent laws right. that apply to complex living systems um so yes um there could be in that sense yes there could be um but i don't know i wouldn't say they'd apply to all complex systems because on our kind of quite um liberal yeah. view a lot of um you know co a condensed matter system is a complex system and so too is uh, uh the internet and so too is the economy um Good. And so I've learned also last night that you're finishing up another book, this one on materialism. Is mm -hmm. that right? That's and, with Robin Brown. Yeah. And this is materialism in the sense of uh, the world is made of matter or not of supernatural forces. It's not about, you know, you're greedy and you want to go shopping because you like money. Right. Yeah. I mean, lots of philosophers would call it physicalism these days, but we, we talk about materialism just because we think that the kind of reader that we want to engage with the book won't know what we mean if we say physicalism. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think Whereas for, they for will your think list, they know what you mean if you say materialism. <laughs> right. Well, they might they might think they're interested in materialism, even and then, then they might want to know more about it. Whereas if you say physicalism, they might just think what. Yeah. Um, I mean, for your listeners to to clarify, physicalism is just what we say in the light of the fact that the can kind of classical early modern conception of matter is not really apt for contemporary physics uh, but one of the things that robin and i um wrote about in a paper from some years ago was that there's a kind of negative side to materialism and a positive side to materialism and the the positive side is that some claim about you know like all there is is the the physical or everything somehow is ultimately physical or you know everything emerges from the physical or what you know, there's lots of different versions of it but but the negative side is you know, no no supernatural stuff i guess um right. and what we're interested in doing is is chronicling the history of those ideas and also the way that materialists have been slandered and persecuted i guess um <laughs> and often you know, people will say things like, oh, well, if you were a materialist, then you must have no morality. Or, uh, yeah, as you said, you know, if you're a materialist, then you, you must only be motivated to pursue, you know, base pleasures or something. And you know, that's obviously not correct. Um, 
and actually one of the things that I've written about elsewhere is that um, you know people often say oh scientism is this terrible view that takes away all the magic from human beings and therefore somehow um, is should is rightly associated with not caring about them and I just point out that if you look at the history you find that the more that we've naturalized our understanding of the of human beings the more we've been inclined to treat people humanely so for example if I if I don't know anything about medicine uh, uh, I might think that my elderly relative has suddenly become a horrible person and when I understand dementia then I'm now I mean it, no necessary connection but but you know it, just, it actually correlates with treating the person more humanely because you realize no they've got a degenerative brain disease it's not their fault that they're now being right. really grumpy and angry a lot um, another example might be autistic children where you you know an old-fashioned view would be something like oh this kid is ki clearly just a crazy kid and that uh, uh, more humane view is no this child has a, is developing differently from how some other children develop um, actually I wouldn't say it's not normal because it's part of the normal spectrum of human right. behaviors and and there are lots of different kind of variations among human beings and it's 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 normal that some people are on the autistic spectrum um, but if you've got someone who's quite a, a young child is quite extreme on the autistic spectrum they may produce behavior which you otherwise would just think they're just a horrible kid once you understand that they're autistic you say oh this child is having under difficulty understanding what's going on we need to communicate them with, it, with them in special ways and when we do that we're able to um, help them develop and be happy and interact with them better and so on so um, I mean you could take other examples you know schizophrenia you know they're not possessed by the devil it's okay right um, so yeah. I think that um, the kind of materialistic naturalistic way of understanding human beings actually correlates with more humane treatments of what we might call um, atypical uh, human psychology and behavior I think this is a it's a fascinating claim and um Partly because, on the one hand, I'm inclined to agree, and my anecdotal experience lines up with this, um, that in some sense, for example, in uh, situations where people are dying, I've found that atheists, naturalists tend to deal with it better than religious people sometimes. Um, but on the other hand, I also recognize I have a huge cognitive bias in this particular area, because that's what I think. And I think that I want to think that people like me are, you know, better equipped to handle these things. So it'd be interesting to study in some rigorous quantitative way, uh, whether the connection between materialism or physicalism or naturalism and humane treatment of other human beings is in fact causal and and a real right. connection or is just a coincidence yeah i mean i'm not making that strong a claim i think that i'm just making the weaker claim that there's no necessary connection whatsoever between a kind of naturalistic view of human beings and a cold clinical attitude to human beings yeah. right um, that's really the point. Um, I'm not making the claim that, you know, naturalists are nicer people than, than religious people. I mean, in fact, there's a lot of evidence that pro-social behavior stro correlates strongly with, with religious. That's true. Right. Um, religious belief. Um, you know, lots of the, the very best, you know, we often maybe those of us who aren't religious may forget that actually a lot of the, the, the really important charity work that's done in this world is done by people with very strong religious commitment and i i respect people's religious faith and i don't think that people who believe in god idiots or irrational or or anything um but i'm just saying that it's you know it's wrong to think that if you're a naturalist um or mater materialist um, that means that you think that human life doesn't matter or that you're going to somehow be cold and disregarding of, of human beings. And is your book mostly about the intellectual history of materialism? You said you were doing a lot of work on, you know, how people with these views were treated and so forth. Right. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, 
a bit historical and a bit about what would a viable contemporary form of physicalism look like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And do you think, I mean, uh, I've, I've felt myself, and again, but I know that I have a bias, so I'm, I'm trying to be careful. On the one hand, the fraction of people who are atheists, naturalists, materialists, physicalists is, seems to be increasing with time, but our popular social discourse hasn't caught up in some way, right? I mean, we still treat atheists as a little scary, you know, on TV or something like that. Yeah, you know, you could look at it this way, you know, if you don't believe in anything supernatural, then that means each of us have got this life and nothing else. And that makes it more important, right? I mean, if if I potentially got the afterlife, then you know, not such a big deal if it doesn't go well for me here, right? But if this is it, and let, let's not talk about me. I mean, let's talk about some child that's born in poverty and destitution, right? That If you think that kid has only got this one life, um, then it matters a hell of a lot that... <laughs> They are their their life options are so curtailed, and their life is full of so much suffering and lack of opportunity. Um, you know, if you tell yourself, "Well, yeah, but don't worry because they're virtuous; they'll God will make up for it later," you might you might be less motivated to do something about it. Now, you might not be, but but you might be. Well, to slightly misuse a phrase, you are preaching to the converted on that. <laughs> I'm very much in agreement. All right, James Ladyman, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much.